One day, he meets the little prince when his plane malfunctions and lands in the Sahara Desert. The little prince told the pilot that he was from a planet called B612 and that when he was only six years old, this gifted boy decided to become an artist. His first childhood painting was not of the sun, flowers, or his parents, but of a python devouring an elephant. When he proudly showed it to the adults around him, many of them congratulated him on his hat leaving him confused and unable to understand the story his art told. So he moved on to a second drawing, showing a cross-section of a python with an elephant inside, so that the adults could understand as well. Although the other children were excited by his drawings, when he showed them to the adults, they simply shook their heads, weary of the children's constant explanations and encouraged the young boy to give up drawing and art, suggesting that he focus on geography, arithmetic, or grammar. So he gave up art and turned his attention to becoming a pilot, at least then he could fly high above the clouds and see the world from a whole new perspective. For the only thing that didn't change was his view of adults who, despite their claims to care about important matters, were too sensible for their own good. On this day, he flew over the Sahara Desert, one of the most isolated, desolate, and lonely places in the world, but one of the most beautiful when viewed from the sky. The desert sand was a stunning display of colors and shapes, the smooth, flawless surface of which was strewn with what looked like an infinite sea of tranquility. Suddenly, huge sand dunes seem to reach out and touch the blue sky, and the desert appears as trails, swirls and brilliant designs, as if nature had made the desert its artistic canvas. The pilot loved every moment of his flight over the Sahara, reminding him of the wonder and beauty of the world. However, he never expected that he would be close enough to witness this wild and beautiful landscape for himself. Suddenly, his plane creaked in the air, he lost altitude, and he clearly realized that his plane was falling. Holding the stick as calmly as possible, he guided the plane down to the sand. He watched the dunes come closer and closer until they towered over him. He landed with a loud thud, sending the sand flying high into the air. It wasn't the most pleasant of landings, but he was relieved to find that he hadn't been hurt in the crash. However, his plane's engine was damaged. He stumbled out of the sand, listening to the squeak of the sand under his shoes. It was clear that his plane could not fly fast enough. He found himself in a predicament, and from the air he could see that there were no people, no houses, no resources in the area, and he had only a few supplies and no one to turn to. Or was there anyone he could turn to? As he fiddled with pencil and paper, he realized for the first time that he wasn't alone when a strange little voice rang out, Can you draw a sheep? Surprised, the pilot turned to see a little boy standing in front of him. The little prince was short, with blonde hair and curious eyes. Initially uneasy about seeing such a young boy in the middle of the desert, the pilot knew he had to take care of the boy and help him find his way home, even though he sensed there was something strange about the boy. He asked the young prince if he could draw a sheep, to which the pilot replied that he could not draw a sheep, but he could draw something else. The pilot smiled, stepped out over the Sahara, and painted his first picture. The little prince took the painting and said with satisfaction, No, I don't want an elephant devoured by a python, they are too dangerous and too big. I need a sheep. The pilot drew many more sheep, but the little prince always refused, saying that it was not the sheep he wanted. Finally, the pilot drew a box with a smile on it and gave the little prince the drawing, telling
telling him that the box contained the sheep he wanted. The little prince embraced the picture with joy, for it was exactly what he had expected. He wondered if there would be enough grass for the sheep to eat in the box, and although there was very little room for the sheep in the box, the pilot wasn't too worried about the imaginary sheep. The days spent in the desert are one of the most interesting times in a pilot's life. The little prince and the pilot spend all their time together, repairing the plane and walking through the nearby desert. They watched the sun set and grew closer as the sunrise woke them up. The pilot learns where this strange little boy came from. On the third day of their encounter, the little prince explained why he wanted a sheep in the first place. He wanted the sheep to eat the seedlings of the monkey bread tree that grew on his planet. Monkey bread trees are huge, beautiful trees with strong roots that cut through the soil. They are majestic, with a canopy of towering branches that cast shadows and shade over large areas of land. But the monkey bread trees have a problem their powerful root system could split the prince's planet into tiny pieces. It's the little prince's job to make sure that doesn't happen. He explains that all planets have good plants and bad plants, and that people need to be vigilant in eliminating the bad ones as soon as possible to avoid future disasters. The pilots can't help but notice the little prince's deep insights into the world, thanks to the powerful and beautiful baobab trees. As they discuss the baobab trees, the two sit on the sand and watch the sun sink below the horizon. The young prince was fascinated by the colors before him, the sunset giving the sky a beautiful mosaic of pinks, reds, oranges and purples, spreading the horizon and the surrounding dunes in color. He told the pilot in a tiny voice, but on his planet you could always see the sunset if you took a few steps. One day he saw the sunset 44 times in one day. This made the pilot realize how tiny the little prince's planet was, and when the sun finally swept over the horizon, he watched the little prince fall asleep in the vastness of the desert so tiny he appeared in the middle of the vastness of the desert. He couldn't imagine this imaginative young boy all alone. As the fifth day rose, the pilot knew he had to start traveling. The plane still wasn't working and they were running out of food and water. He spent most of the day trying to piece together the engine and get it to work. Meanwhile, the little prince walked around looking worried at his picture of the sheep. He asked the busy pilot if the sheep would eat the shrubs and flowers on his planet. The pilot replied that the sheep would eat anything. The little prince was worried about the flowers with thorns because they could not protect the flowers. The pilot cannot think about flowers, sheep, distant planets or the sweetness of the universe, he can only think about their survival. He gets angry with the little prince, telling him that he is busy with important matters, and the little prince cries out in pain, his hands clenched into fists, hurt and angry. You are acting like a mature adult. He declared that if someone fell in love with a flower that existed in only one of millions of stars, that would be enough to make him happy when he looked up at the stars. My flower is out there somewhere, he tells himself. But if the sheep ate the flower, it would be as if all the stars had suddenly gone out for him, and it wouldn't matter. The pilot stopped working on the plane, and these words created a powerful wave over him, and then the little prince began to cry, and the pilot glided over to him and took the young boy in his arms to comfort him. Getting out of the desert was important indeed, but the happiness of his new friends was the most important thing. After all, 
the only thing they had in the world now was each other and the stories they shared with each other. Hannah will be fine, I promise, the pilot whispered to his young companion. If I draw a muzzle on a sheep and you tell me about this beautiful flower of yours, the little prince smiled and wiped the tears from his bright blue eyes as he dropped down to sit on the sand and looked up at the sky, at the universe, somewhere where his beloved flower still existed. One day he explained that he had discovered a new plant on his planet, at first he feared it might be a new type of rats, but as it grew day by day it became clear that it was far from the rats he was used to seeing. The plant soon reveals itself to be a rose in the night sky. She was a beacon of beauty, a flash of red in a sea of darkness, and her beauty touched the little prince for a moment. He had never seen a plant like her before, and she brought him great joy. She told him that she was the only flower in the whole universe, the most beautiful of all plants. She was indeed a beautiful creature, even though she was a bit narcissistic and asked the little prince to take care of her every day. He watered her to keep her hydrated, made a lampshade to keep her warm and cozy at night, and a screen to protect her from the winds that threatened her petals. Despite the fact that he served her day in and day out and that the little prince loved her dearly, one day the little prince found out that Rose had lied to him. She mentioned that it was not windy where she came from, and even though the young prince had watched her grow on his planet, her small lie made the young prince doubt their relationship so far. Was her love and care for him genuine? Or was it based on a lie because she wanted to be taken care of? The questions that rolled out of this lie made the little prince more and more suspicious as time went by, and he began to feel betrayed and alone by Rose. So he decides to leave his planet in preparation, and he carefully cleans up his two active volcanoes and a third that has disappeared, just to be sure. As he watered the rose for the last time, he fought back tears and lifted the dome to place it on the rose, saying, Goodbye, for the last time. The rose takes a long time to apologize to the little prince, she assures him that she loves him, tells him that he will never need to dome her again, and she promises that she will be fine without him to take care of her. She urged him to leave, turning away so that he wouldn't see the tears rolling down her petals. The young prince did as she said and set off on a journey through the universe with the help of a flock of wild birds. Stopping at each asteroid, he met some incredibly strange adults who told him how the universe worked, or rather how it didn't work. On the first asteroid, the young prince found himself standing in front of a king who had no subjects, but possessed great power. He wore an attractive fur cloak and sat on a throne made of gold and precious stones. The king proudly proclaimed that he was the ruler of the universe, and that he was in charge of the rain that fell on every star the little prince saw. However, when the little prince asks the king to order the sun to set, the king replies that of course the sun will obey him, but they will have to wait until 7.40 p.m. The little prince cannot help but notice that the king searches through an almanac before deciding on a time. Desperately, the king invites the little prince to stay on his planet and take on the role of minister of justice, a role that seems meaningless to the little prince since there is no one on the asteroid to judge. The young prince moves on, perplexed by the king's strange behavior. The second planet is inhabited by an egotistical man who desires nothing but praise and admiration, insisting on being the most admired man on this strange, uninhabited planet. On the third asteroid, he meets an alcoholic who cannot stop drinking because he longs to forget the shame he feels because of it. 
The fourth asteroid belonged to a merchant who barely had time to say good morning to the little prince and then went on counting the stars in the sky. Why did he do this? To own them, of course, because that would make him rich. He explained that once he was rich, he could buy more stars, and if he found new ones, he could buy more. He didn't have time for small talk, as he was in the middle of important business. The fifth asteroid was the smallest, and there was only enough room on it for a street fixture and a lamplighter. The lamplighter politely explained that he had been ordered to light the lamps at night and put them out in the morning. His orders used to make sense, but recently the planet has begun to spin faster and faster, and now a day on this planet lasts only one minute. The young prince watched in awe as the lamplighter lit the entire asteroid's fire with amazing orange biscuits, giving off a soft, breathtaking glow. Then, as the fire begins to rise, the lamplighter extinguishes the flame, causing a plume of smoke to rise into the sky. The young prince watched the eternal dance for a long time, praising the lamplighter's sense of duty and righteousness, and the beauty he brought to the world with his tiny flame. But when the prince suggested that the lamplighter rest with the sun, his advice fell on deaf ears. The lamplighter continues his eternal dance with the light, following the original order to the letter. The young prince says, goodbye, to his beloved lamplighter, and with up to 1,440 potential sunsets a day, there are still other places to explore. The sixth planet was vast, perhaps ten times larger than the previous asteroids, and an old geographer greeted the young prince behind a grand desk, hoping that the visitor might be an explorer. The young prince was very excited and asked about the oceans or mountains that adorned the vast planet. Surprisingly, the geographer didn't know anything about them because he wasn't technically an explorer, so he had never been anywhere and had never seen anything he was supposed to record. But since the geographer was interested in the geography of the little prince's planet, the boy told him about his three volcanoes and his rats and his precious roses. I'm not interested in roses, the geographer said, they're short-lived, they disappear quickly. My roses are short-lived, too, murmured the little prince, who was all alone in the world, with only four thorns to protect her from herself. After a moment of deep remorse, the little prince musters up his courage once again and, on the advice of a geographer, decides to visit Earth, perhaps the most perplexing of all the places he has explored. He finds himself in a desert, surrounded by no one. He thinks he is in an uninhabited place similar to his own planet. But soon the young prince encounters a yellow serpent who claims to have the power to bring him back home if he has the will to go back. He is hesitant about the offer, so he travels across the desert in search of humans. In the desert, he meets a desert flower with three petals. She has seen a traveling party before, so she tells the prince that there are very few people on earth perhaps only six or seven in all, and that they have no roots, they drift with the wind, which makes their lives extremely challenging. The little prince searches the vast and inhospitable landscape for people and for something more. He followed a dirt road that curved through the desert. One day, as he walked along this dirt road, listening to the crunching of the ground beneath his feet, a flash of green and red entered his vision, and as he drew nearer, the distinct smell of fresh flowers enveloped him. He stood before a garden of roses, a vast expanse of flowers. He had thought that his beloved rose was unique, that there was nothing else like her in the entire universe, and now he could see that this was not true. 
Feeling heartbroken, the little prince lay down on the grass in the garden and began to cry. While he was crying, a little fox appeared and was upset to find out that his favorite rose was just an ordinary one. The prince asked the fox if he would like to play with him, to which the fox replied that you first need to tame me. He explains to the young prince that taming means creating a bond, and at the moment the fox and the young prince know nothing about each other, but if the young prince tames the fox, they will be connected and need each other, they will be unique and special to each other. Maybe they will share a friendship. But the fox told the little prince that if he tamed him, you would expect the sound of footsteps instead of running away, and that the golden wheat fields would make the fox happy because they would remind him of his friend's beautiful golden hair. Over time, the little prince tamed the fox and realized that a flower had tamed him too. When the little prince leaves, the fox cries softly, thanking him for giving him a reason to look at the wheat fields and admire their beauty. As the little prince walks towards the horizon, the fox tells him to visit the rose garden again and then you will finally understand why the roses on his planet are so special to him. The prince followed the fox's words and went to the rose garden, just as the fox had told him. In the garden, hidden among the flowers and leaves, the little prince began to realize that his roses really meant a lot to him. All these roses might be equally beautiful, but they were not his roses, his roses were unique to him because he loved and cared for her. Inspired by this realization, the prince went back to say, Goodbye, to the fox. The fox was proud of the lessons the young prince had learned, and as they sat looking out over the wheat fields, the fox told him an important truth, only the heart can see clearly, the eyes miss the important things. It is the time the young prince spends with his beloved Rose and the bond they forge that makes her special.